This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, so Tracy Denunzio is here. She is the founder and CEO of Tradesy. Tradesy is a, a website as well as a mobile app that lets women buy, sell, buy and sell designer fashion in a in a safe, quick, um, and easy and easy environment. It was possible to do it before. You could do it a variety of different ways. Tra um, Tracy's just made it easier. She's exactly the type of entrepreneur that I want to invest in. As you guys know, I'm a venture capitalist. I'm really in the business of investing in people. Um, and Tracy epitomizes the kind of person that I look for. Um, she just will not be denied. Failure is not going to happen in Tracy's world. If there's an obstacle, she's going to go over it, under it, around it, or through it. That's the mentality that she has. And I think that's the mentality that um, all successful entrepreneurs have to have. I strongly encourage you to watch an interview that she did that really was the turning point for me. She did an interview with Mark Suster on This Week in VC uh, about a, a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And you can't watch that video without, want, without rooting for her and wanting to see her succeed. You're going to hear part of that story tonight. She's also the founder of Tracy's sister site, Recycled Bride. That was a fragmented market a market where you could go in and resell um, a wedding dress or a bridesmaid's dress or something else from a wedding. You could resell it. There was lots of sites um, doing that when uh, Tracy broke into that market. She owns that space right now. Her site is the dominant place to buy and sell um, uh, wedding items in the aftermarket. She's a self-taught entrepreneur, um, and she's a growth hacker. Before she became a tech entrepreneur, she was an artist. She went all over the world selling and showing her art. Artists are entrepreneurs. Artists have to make it happen. They're creating something from nothing, um, and if they want to be successful at it from a commercial vantage point, they have to get out there and hustle, and that's exactly what Tracy did. She's now an expert in fashion, weddings, finance, and marketing, and she writes for the Huffington Post, and she's appeared on a number of different um, television venues, including Good Morning America, NBC News, and ABC News. Let's give Tracy a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you guys. John forgot to mention that I'm also sweaty. That's, that's a big thing. So I had actually, like, as John mentioned, he emailed me to do this in August. Um, and a few weeks ago, I started preparing what I thought was an appropriate college lecture. I had 10 ways to bootstrap your business and things that make you a great entrepreneur. And it was so boring. And you guys hear lectures all the time. And so what you're about to hear, I wrote in the car, and it's uh, on the way out here, and it's a whole bunch of really fun stories that have a little bit to do with business, a lot to do with life, um, and I was inspired to sort of share more about what brought me to this point in, in my career with you guys. Um, because I'm really excited for you because you're about to go on the scariest, craziest adventure in the entire world. It's your 20s, and it's going to mess you up so good, but it's going to be really cool, too. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine, um, and then and then tell you about the business. And, uh, and I had to put this in that there's a disclaimer here. So I know you guys have had a lot of really um, 
rich people come here and talk to you. I haven't made my millions and billions yet. I might be closer to where you guys are sitting than I am to some of the venture capitalists and captains of industry that you've heard from. Um, I'm, I'm probably halfway there in terms of the milestones and the things that you have to get through to kind of claw your way to the top. And so I can speak to you a lot about the things in my life that prepared me to do this and what it's like to kind of start from nowhere and get to somewhere. Uh, so in the last four years, I've built two sites and gotten zero sleep. Um, and, um, and, and John did a pretty good job of introducing what the sites are. So I'm actually gonna come back to this in a bit, but I'm gonna jump right into talking about some stuff that happened way before all this happened. So innovation isn't like, oh, you're born with some gift of prophecy and you're just gonna come up with an idea and do it. It's a combination of information, knowledge, all the things that have ever come before you that people have worked hard to accumulate, uh, data, and, and everything you can learn about something combined with your own unique gut feeling and a new connection between different pieces of information that maybe nobody has made before or that maybe you haven't found yet. So that was my first innovation. I, I, I had a medical innovation and I, I felt that I understood how to take this big risk and innovate on this idea of six weeks in a cast, and it worked out pretty well. Um, and I, uh, and so I started painting about everything that was happening, because at the time I was an artist, and um, I was really interested in learning more about the whole Asian Orange thing. I was doing some activism at that time around it, um, but more than anything. I just wanted to make something that reflected everything I was learning and everything I was feeling and understanding at the time. And so I started making these paintings using my dad's old photos from Vietnam. And I would cut them up and stitch them into canvas and then paint around them. And I was calling the whole series A Stitch in Time. And I had no expectation that anybody was ever going to look at these paintings. They were just something to do while I was recovering from surgery. Uh, and one day, a friend of mine stopped by to visit. Sorry, I keep fanning myself. It is hot. <laughs> um, a friend of mine stopped by. She was on her way out to the Hamptons with some like really important dude who owned a nightclub. And he saw what I was doing, and he was super inspired by it. And he happened to be opening an art gallery, and that was how I got my first art exhibit in New York City as an undergraduate. Um, which was kind of a big deal at the time and, and really started my art career on the right foot. Um, that said, I did a lot of other projects that nobody ever saw. And if you're not making anything, then nothing can happen, right? So it's okay to sit in front of the TV and veg out sometimes. I do that more than I care to admit. But there's something about just engaging in a process of creating something where once there was nothing. So it doesn't matter if it's a spreadsheet and a financial model, if it's a business plan for a company you're never gonna start, if it's a piece of art, if it's a song that you write, even if you're not a songwriter, just the fact that you're making something and that you always need to be making something, which is kind of how I always felt, um, eventually draws a result that leads to something that leads to something else. In this case, what this particular exhibition led to for me was a bunch of other exhibitions. Um, opportunity begets opportunity, and that's something that's held true for me and everything I've seen in life for, for all my long 34 years here. So, um, so for me, this led to um, the VA, the Veterans Association, asking me at the ripe old age of 21 to come and give the keynote speech at their 2000 Veterans Day conference in front of 6,000 servicemen, including like decorated army captains who were not the keynote speaker. I was, and I felt really dumb about it. I was really freaked out, and I almost fainted when I had to get, it was the first time I ever spoke in public. I still don't love doing it, but at that point it was, I, I really thought I was gonna faint on that stage because I felt really um, inadequate. I was like, how can I tell this room full of men who have seen war, who have had children, who have lived lives, what do I have to tell them? 
I'm so young and I just made some pictures. Um, but you know what? Old people need you. <laughs> um, the, the excitement and the creativity and the clarity that comes from youth, from where you guys are right now, um, is really, really valuable to people who have more experience um, and more connections and more money than you do. And those are the people that you want to find and show and say, hey, here's my, here's my innovation. Here's my youthful creativity. Here's the, the abundance that's coming out of me right now because I'm excited about the world and I'm not that conscious of its limitations. Can you pair that with your experience and maybe some of your money and your support and your mentorship and maybe we can make something? Um, I mean, that's a very, very simplified way of talking about what it's like to raise investment capital or get advisors. I'm not calling you old, John, by the way. <laughs> by old, I mean experienced. Um, so after that, um, I got a scholarship to get my master's degree. And because I was an awesome New York City artist who was having early success that nobody could believe, I applied to Yale, which had the best MFA program in the country and accepted three painters a year, and I got a big fat rejection letter. And I had one month to find another school that would accept me or I was gonna lose that scholarship. So I had a friend who was living in Mexico and she said, well, there's a university here and they'll let anybody in. And so I bought a plane ticket and was off to Mexico. Um, you know, you hear this like all the time thing like, oh, lemonade out of lemons and all that stuff. Sometimes it's just lemons. And if I had gotten into Yale, I probably would have had a much better art career. Um, instead, I did something different and it's still awesome. Um, but the thing that I learned from that was not so much make lemonade out of lemons. It was more like there's the two things that I think have made me able to survive in this crazy environment of entrepreneurship are ad adaptability and flexibility. So kind of like what I was saying before, like the, there's no way to prevent rejection, failure, market conditions smacking you in the face when you have a business, um, competitors killing your market, all kinds of things that you cannot predict. They're gonna happen to everybody. It's all about how quickly you adapt and you bounce back. And so there's no such thing as the guy who's like, oh, I started my business and it just took off, it was awesome. When you hear people saying that, they're lying. Every one of them, I promise you, is lying. Those are PR stories, and I know, I do a lot of PR. There's no such thing. It's grueling and difficult for every single entrepreneur, no matter what their circumstances, and the ones who win are the ones who are adaptable. Um, and so, so for me, that adaptability was flipping the switch. I'm moving my whole life to Mexico. And I met a boy. And he was a salsa instructor, of course, because it had to be that way. Um, and he wanted to dance. And I was like, hey, listen, I can't. Well, I didn't say this because I didn't speak Spanish yet. But I, I tried to say, I can't dance. Like, I can't even feel my feet. And I assumed that not being able to feel your feet was kind of would kind of eliminate you from being able to dance. I just I figured that. As it turned out, not so much. Um, he finally convinced me to try and learn, and because he was a really good partner, he was able to compensate for the things that I couldn't do, and even use the fact that like my feet were fused and I couldn't feel anything to do some crazy tricks that would have probably hurt someone else's feet, but for me it was all good. <laughs> And we went and toured um, different parts of Mexico doing dancing ex exhibitions, which was crazy because I thought I wasn't even gonna walk, let alone dance. And, um, and from that, I kind of just learned to challenge assumptions, right? So you, everybody has limitations. I don't, doesn't matter what yours is. It could be a learning disability, it could be, to left feet, it could be anything, but you're you're probably making assumptions based on that limitation about what you can and can't do, and they might be true. I don't know, but they might not be true, 
And so you have to test them. And this is something that we do relentlessly in technology startups is that we test our assumptions. Data wins, you know? So whatever you're thinking is gonna stop you or the circumstance that's dictating the decision that you're making, just make sure you test it first because you might be able to dance. It You, you don't know. Um, uh, so after dancing my way through Mexico and doing a bunch of exhibitions all over that country and all over Europe, because being a New York artist in other countries is like a very sexy thing and everybody wants to show your work. Being a New York artist in New York, nobody cares <laughs> about you. And so when I left Mexico, went back to New York, um, I was starting to feel like my career wasn't going anywhere. And But I had had this... Since I was a kid, I wanted to be an artist. It was all I ever wanted to do. Like when I was five, I said, I'm going to be an artist and live in the East Village, like, which is, I don't even know how I knew what the East Village was, but that was what I, that was the life that I had always dreamed of. And having lived it for a while, it was cool, but I kind of felt like I wanted to do something different at that point. But I felt bad. I felt like because I had put a stake in the ground and said, this is what I do and who I am and what I'm doing, that I couldn't change it. And I spent two years, so this is the biggest waste of time in history, just don't do this. I spent two years trying to figure out whether I should stop painting and like sitting in front of blank canvases, driving myself crazy. In, in tech startup world, they call it pivoting, <laughs> when you stop doing what you were doing and do something completely new. Um, I, I thought of it as quitting and I thought it was a horrible thing to do. It's not. Sometimes it's time to move on. It doesn't matter what you told people you were going to do. You have to do the thing that one has enough opportunity in that market to sustain you and financially and whatever your goals are. And two, that makes you want to get out of bed every morning. Uh, I just didn't want to get out of bed and look at blank canvases anymore. Um, so I did quit. Um, and right around that time, I met a neighbor and we fell in love and we got married. And we had a big, um, terrible wedding. <laughs> and when I say terrible, I mean that having lived in Mexico and, and being in a country where people don't waste a whole lot, um, I felt that it was very, very wasteful to spend all this money on one day and buy all these products that took all these natural resources to create and then just toss them after four hours. And that was how the idea for Recycled Bride came about because I said, well, I'm going to get a wedding dress on eBay. And then that was a terrible experience. And then I said, okay, well, I'll buy a wedding dress, but I'm going to sell it afterwards. And I didn't find a place to do it that was um, comfortable for me ha because at that time, the only thing I knew how to do online was surf the web and write an email. Um, so I started thinking about potentially starting a website uh and that but but i had this like attachment to this artist identity so this is like one of my favorite quotes and and it's simple but it's really really meaningful this is an artist named joseph boys who was a german artist in the 40s and 50s who made crazy weird art like that stuff you see up there that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to people who think of art as just paintings on walls and sculptures but Joseph Boys, the point of all of his work was to show his audience that all the work of man is art. So he said, I don't care if you're a plumber, an architect, a sculptor, a dishwasher. If you're doing your work in a way in which you're engaged and where you want it to be better than it's ever been before, you're making your art. And so my idea of what I could do do as an artist started to transform. And I started to think, well, do I have to paint paintings to be an artist? Can, can art and commerce live together? Um, and I kind of decided to go for it. Um, but that's kind of a lie. I didn't really decide to go for it. I also sat with that for six months. So I've made a lot of mistakes, but this is one of my bigger ones. Because I, I look back at that two, two and a half years, I wasted all, I could, you know where we could have been if we had launched two and a half years earlier? And I sat there thinking of other ideas. I was like, well, okay, I want to launch a website, but maybe it's not about weddings. Maybe it's not about buying and selling. And the clock was ticking. 
the whole time. And now I know how precious six months is in a market like this. Um, so I think for any of you who are thinking about entrepreneurship, who are really thinking about like just starting your own thing, the idea doesn't matter. You are going to spend most of your time marketing, figuring out how to get technology built. Good luck with that. Managing people, um, trying to raise capital, more marketing, learning how to write emails to important people and beg them for 10 minutes of their time. That's going to be your job, whether you sell widgets or fashion or wedding dresses or software. And so the thing that that your site or your product is about should be interesting to you and should be interesting to a large customer base. And beyond that, you got to just start because you can always pivot, but you can't get back lost time. And that like analysis paralysis, especially after college, because there are too many options for you guys, it'll kill you. Just make something. Stop thinking about it. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's just what you do. And now we're getting to the fun part. So, uh, so I sold all my paintings on Craigslist, and I got together enough money to build what I now know is called an MVP, Minimum Viable Product of Recycled Bride. Um, I was so I so I was I used the money that I that I from selling my paintings. I had no experience, and I didn't have a team, but what I had was my husband, who was an internet entrepreneur who had started a website early on, like in 1999. And he gave me a little advice. Some of it I took, some of it I thought I knew better. Sometimes he was right, sometimes I was right. Um, but you can see on this graph, that's Recycled Bride's Google Analytics. So we've never paid for traffic on Recycled Bride, meaning um, we don't do paid marketing. What we do, when, when John said, I'm a growth hacker, um, we do guerrilla marketing and search engine optimization and social media and blogging and all the ways you can get traffic for free because I didn't have any money in the beginning. And if you look up there at right before January 2010, September 9th, 2009 was the day we launched. We had eight visitors. Six of them were my parents coming back over and over again. And I didn't know what the hell to do because I didn't, I didn't have any of the skills. I didn't, I didn't even know what SEO meant at the time. As you can see, it's gone okay. <laughs> um, so every year in January, our traffic around doubles. Um, that's because the engagement season is over the holidays. 35 to 40% of all engagements happen between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And then 90% of brides plan their weddings at work. So, for all of, for future employers, watch the engaged girls. But um, so they all go back to work on like January fourth or fifth, and they jump on the computer and they see recycled bride. And the growth that you're seeing comes from a an SEO algorithm that I wrote. Doesn't that sound cool? <laughs> That's what I say when I meet with people who aren't in technology. I just say I wrote an algorithm, and then I let them their minds get blown. Um, it's actually not that complicated. It's a very simple algorithm, and it just had to do with, I, I saw that we had user-generated content, meaning we had people putting products on the site for sale. And I knew that other people were searching for those products using Google, and that it only made sense to try and connect them. So I just started staying up all night, reading everything I could about search engine optimization, and I did some hacky things and um, made it so that if you search for Vera Wang wedding dress style number one, two, three, four, and we have one, we'll come up first, maybe second, usually first. And so the growth that you see year over year is because we have more product on the site. So more searches. Now we drive traffic from over 100,000 unique keywords a month. And we are, you can see what's happening January of this year. That's about 25 to 30,000 unique visitors a day, which is close to a million visitors a month, which is fairly big for any website but in this market it's really big and having never paid for traffic it's huge so this is exciting um but on day one it didn't this i didn't know that this was going to happen um and then something else happened my husband and i split up 
yes, the wedding just happened in the story and also in real life. It was like, it was a starter marriage. It was like an eight month thing. Um, and at that point, so it was like a month after the site launched and I looked at my life and I was like, well, if there was ever a sign that I am doing something wrong, this is probably it because I have a website called Recycled Bride with no visitors and I'm getting a divorce <laughs> and that's embarrassing and really pathetic and maybe this is all a sign that I am on the very wrong track here and I should just fold this thing and move on. Um, but I didn't and I don't think that there are omens. So this is a Steve Jobs quote, like uh, that half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful ones is pure perseverance. And I have come to realize how true that is. Um, everything was pointing down at that point. So uh, my ex-husband and I had just moved into this like beautiful two bedroom beachfront apartment. He moved out, then his company got sued. He didn't have any money to help me. And I was broke living in like a palace with a website that nobody came to. And I really didn't know what to do with myself. So I decided that I couldn't fail because I kind of felt like I had failed at the art thing and I wasn't going to do it again. Um, so I started consulting for other startups for eight to ten dollars an hour doing data entry and social media. My only condition was that I had to do it from home because I didn't want to have to take off my sweatpants and brush my hair and go into an office every day. I wanted to be in front of my computer all the time. And I knew that I could squeeze in like five to six hours of work for their company and then do another five to six hours of work for my company and then do another five to six hours of learning and eventually at some point maybe sleep. I'm still waiting for that to happen. Um, and this was where some of those early life lessons really came in in this, in this phase. So it was painful. Like, I w wasn't happy, and I was working all the time, and I didn't particularly love what I was doing yet. Um, and everything was just terrible. And um, But I had learned, like, after I had all those surgeries, I can remember going in and talking to the doctors and being like, so my back and my legs kind of hurt. When's that going to go away? And they were like, never. And I was like, oh, okay. So how does, how do you do that? And that was when I went more again into my, like not being a doctor, but playing one on TV and doing a bunch of research and learning about how, um, pain signals work in the brain and started learning how to replace the So the pain signal travels down the same neural path. This is not scientific, by the way, this is just don't take my word for this, but this is what I pulled from my research. Um, pain signals are traveling down the same neural pathways as thought signals. So if you can replace the pain signal with a, with a thought that counters it, maybe the pain goes away. I tried doing that for a few years and I don't know if it's why, but I don't feel pain anymore. The only time I know that I have chronic pain is when I take a Vicodin and then I'm like, oh, this feels good. There's no pain there, but I don't notice it anymore. And so what I realized that you could kind of, you could kind of block pain by pushing it off to the side and filling those neural pathways with good thoughts. And that also the whole thing about pain is that it's not that big a deal. It's actually all the thoughts that happen around it. Like, when is this going to stop? Is it ever going to get better? Am I going to fail? This thing is never going to work. This is terrible. I want to stop. I'd rather be watching TV. It's those things. It's not the actual discomfort or the actual pain. It's the anticipation and the concern about what it means and where it's all going. And if you can let go of that, you can sit in the really uncomfortable part where you're working 20 hours a day and making no money and nobody cares about what you're doing for as long as it takes. Um, and it sure felt like it took a long time, but <laughs> it started working. And as it started working and we started getting traffic, I realized that knowing about marketing and knowing how to get some traffic to the site wasn't enough. I had to become a wedding expert um, because you do need some domain expertise about what you're doing. So 
remember before when I said you're mostly going to market and worry about technology and fundraising and not about the thing that you're doing? Well, it's true, but at a certain point, you become the face of your business. That's what I'm doing right now. And, um, and I wasn't prepared for that either. I wasn't prepared to be in public and to go on TV and talk about the royal wedding. Um, but I decided that it wasn't that boring. It was actually kind of interesting. And that the same kind of curiosity about marketing and search engines and technology could be applied to weddings and fashion and anything else, really. Um, so I started the same late night learning process, except I was learning about weddings. So I can tell you everything about like crinolines and lace and like what the new styles are, if you're interested. <laughs> um, and I started getting, so, okay, so I decided that I had to get on TV because there weren't enough people on the site and I figured TV was a pretty big megaphone and I was pretty sure they didn't charge you to do that. So I wanted to find television producers that would give me some airtime and, and let me, and put like my name and wedding expert next to it on the TV. <laughs> and so, but I didn't have any contacts at all. So I used Twitter and I started finding all of the junior producers and associate producers at all the local news stations all over the country and following them on Twitter. And I didn't like come right out and, hey, I want to do a segment. I like retweeted them and I was like, that's so clever. <laughs> OMG, love it. You know, it wasn't inauthentic. It was, it was authentic. I responded to things that I thought were cool, but it was a bit of an effort, um, and I and I kept a little chart of who was who and how many times I had retweeted or communicated with them, and then eventually I said I would reach out and say, "Hey, follow me back. I just want to send you a quick DM," and then I would send them a 140 character pitch for a segment that would take me three hours to write <laughs> because it's really hard to get that pitch into 140 characters. Um, but I started getting on TV. And that was scary, <laughs> too. Um, that's where I learned to get mic'd. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I started in Arizona and then in New Mexico. I don't know. I was a hit in the Sunbelt sta Sun States for a while. And then I made a contact at NBC LA, and they introduced me to NBC New York. And we started, so you can, mm, well, the slide's not up there anymore, but we started getting some really big press spikes. And I started getting all these inbound inquiries. People thought I was important. They still are like believing that, but <laughs> it was crazy. You know, people who I had emailed early on and said, hey, could we do a partnership? Would you link to me? And they would totally ignore me. We're like, oh, can we feature you? PR is super powerful, but you can't get it unless you have something to say. So you have to be really curious about everything you're doing and be like, now I'm an expert on, well, John ticked it off, right? Expert on all these things. Why? Because I Googled it. So it, it, you can be an expert. Just stay up late and read. And then make sure that when they start rolling the cameras, you have some good stuff to say. Um, so this was something we talked about in the group before, because now I keep telling you guys, oh, I didn't, I didn't sleep and I had Twitter charts. And it's like, well, how do you have a life, right? And um, for me, I really love work. Like, I don't really want to do anything else. Um, I, I have a personal life, and it's awesome, but I think there's a new way to do this. So if for any of you who are either thinking about starting your own company or thinking about joining a startup, um, you will have to work like crazy, but the world is different. You know, you can... I hang out at my husband, um, I'm remarried, spoiler alert, spo spoiler alert. Um, you know, I go with him to his recording studio on the weekends and I throw some noise canceling headphones on and I, and I work and then we have a meal and then we come home and he watches TV and I work and then I wake up in the morning and if I'm in the mood, I work and you know, it's just like, it's constant, but I like it. Like what else would I do with my time? I don't even know what I would do because it's the most interesting thing in my life aside from my husband and so you know it's I don't think that there's a, a balance so much as an integration if you love your job then you don't need to be like oh my god how am I gonna get 
more time away from work so I can have other things in my life. Your job kind of is your life, but it's because you picked it. And I don't, I mean, that's how it is for me. Um, so, okay, so this goes back to kind of that Twitter thing. Um, so then once I got on TV and I fooled people into thinking I was important, um, I was able to start networking a little bit. Um, because I had been holed up in my house wearing sweatpants for like a year and a half at that point. And it was time to start talking to some people and making some contacts and maybe raising some money to do some bigger things. Um, but here's what I didn't do. And this might be controversial, um, but this is what I really think. <laughs> so there are a ton of events for entrepreneurs. There are a million places that you can go to hear people like me blow a lot of hot air <laughs> and meet a lot of other people who think they might want to be entrepreneurs. I think that those events are a complete waste of time. Um, sure, you can network, you can meet a bunch of people, exchange a bunch of business cards, make an, a bunch of coffee appointments, maybe extract a word of wisdom or two, um, get an idea, make a friend. And that's cool if you're in an exploratory phase, but if you're building a business, then you have no business doing anything but building your business. And there is a much smarter way to network. You can choose people, look them up on the internet, and say, I'm going to meet that person. And then start stalking them and figure <laughs> out how you can get to them. It's a much better use of your time. Um, I did this with um, Danny Levy, who was the founder of Daily Candy. Um, which you guys were just babies, but it was one of the first most successful women's websites and really pioneered that like daily email model. Um, and, and she was the founder and CEO. The company sold for $125 million to Comcast when she was around my age. Um, and I got a contact to her and actually managed to get her to agree to meet me for a drink. Um, I showed up two hours early. I got super drunk because I was nervous and I didn't eat. And then I had two glasses of wine. It was like a bad combination. I was wasted when she showed up. And it was embarrassing. Um, but um, she became our first investor. And she, <laughs> yeah, if you can drink with an investor, you've got them. Um, so, um, so, so she actually, um, offered to invest at the table that night um, on our first meeting and we were her only investment and it was just mind blowing. But you know, it, she probably still doesn't know, although when this is on the internet, she'll know the legwork that it took to get me to that table. She didn't know, she thought, oh, a friend uh, thought that this would be a fun meeting. I had that thing planned for months and had to like really like network my way to the guy who could make the intro and um, you can do that too. Anyone can do that. The best approach, by the way, that I've ever heard, because I do these events sometimes and and I and then afterwards like people want to meet and talk about their idea. And I had this guy reach out with the best email I've ever heard. I suggest you all copy him. He was like, Hey, I heard you speak. It was really fun. I know you're super busy, but you've still got to eat. So I would like to bring you a meal any day, any time, anywhere at your convenience and have 25 minutes of your time while you eat. And I was like, yeah, because that's awesome. That is such a good approach. Like, it's really hard to reach out to people who are super, super busy and ask for their time. So make sure you have something really important to say to them and really good, whether it's an ask or a tell. Um, and reach out like that. Just copy that guy. I'm sorry to that guy. Um, so. So we talked about not turning lemons into lemonade because that's a boring cliche. Um, but I did have, okay, so, so the next like lemons that came along were Recycle Bride was starting to pick up. Everything was really starting to go okay. And then my roommate said she was moving out. Um, right as I had just put like a whole bunch more money into building a new feature because we were using a, I was using an outsourced development firm. Um, and this is a whole other thing, but I had, I had a tech team, like an agency building my technology and I was doing everything else. So I had just given them like 
14 grand that I had saved up over months and months of working for $10 an hour. And then my roommate was like, I'm moving out tomorrow. <laughs> and so I was like, how am I going to pay rent? What am I going to do? And there was this new website called Airbnb that had just come out. Um, I don't know if you guys have probably heard of it, but it's a site that lets you rent rooms or space to travelers. And so I kind of took stock and I said, well, I have this nice place on the beach and there are two bedrooms here. What if I slept on the couch and rented both bedrooms out and I made a quick spreadsheet and I was like, oh, at 80% occupancy, I'm making money here. Okay, I'm opening a hotel. And <laughs> I put the apartment up on Airbnb and I got a couple of inquiries, but I wasn't sure like if I was really comfortable having strangers come in, I don't know. First two guys that inquired, I just got weirded and I said, uh, sorry, it's occupied. Because this was all really new back then. I didn't know if it was even safe. And then I got my third inquiry from a musician who was, um, hey, I'm in the airport in Reykjavik, about to get on my flight, can I come? And I said, okay, I need you to send me some references, like a Facebook profile or whatever, and he sent me a song. And I was like, oh, is this guy kidding me? <laughs> and <laughs> I listened to the song, and because the song was pretty good, and I really needed the money, <laughs> I said, okay, fine. And 17 hours later, my husband walked in. Uh, <laughs> he was my first guest ever, and he came with a guitar on his back and a bottle of champagne, and he said, am I in the right place? Because I thought this was a bed and breakfast. And I was like, no, and so he his poor Googling skills are actually the reason we're together because he Googled Santa Monica B&B, <laughs> landed on Airbnb, and did not understand that it was individual people renting out their spaces. He thought it was a bed and breakfast. Anyway, um, we hit it off, and he stayed, uh, And but I still needed to rent the place on Airbnb, so we moved into one of the bedrooms together, but we went on to rent our middle bedroom and our couch on Airbnb for over a year, made close to $30,000 from it, funded the company to, and well past profitability, um, and met some really cool people and drank a lot of champagne. Um, and I think it goes back to the risk thing. So I don't want to tell anyone to be reckless because I think I'm probably reckless and that's probably not good. But the risk thing, the openness to any possibility and it's it all ties into that like adaptability. I didn't know these were entrepreneur qualities. I just thought I was screwed up. But now I see that all this stuff like being open to opportunities and willing to like adapt and say, oh, no yell, oh, I'll go to Mexico. You know, th this is actually what life is like every day in a startup um, and when you start a company because things tank and fall apart every minute and things also explode and become amazing all the time um, and it's a roller coaster but it's all about just like bouncing back bouncing back and l following the chain of opportunity as it comes and as open as you can be to it um, a note on competition so at that point so I had always kind of thought that the bridal thing should really be a fashion thing because the wedding dresses are an obvious resale, like an uh, obvious candidate for resale. But I would go and get dressed every morning and look in my closet and say, I'm not wearing any of this stuff. And as I was looking for ways to sell off everything I owned and every bit of space in my home to fund the company, I'm looking at a closet full of kind of nice clothes that I used to wear when I went out and didn't sit in, my, in front of my computer 18 hours a day. And I'm like, I, I should be able to sell this stuff. And again, eBay, so complicated. And now I knew, now I had data that said that, because we did all this user testing with our Recycled Bride users, and we found that it takes the average woman 35 minutes to sign up and create her first listing on eBay. We found out that only 47% of eBay users are women, but women are making 85% of consumer purchases online. eBay's not working for women. And I still have this closet full of stuff I can't sell. Um, and I started to develop, the to, to get more excited about the idea for Tradesy and also to realize that we needed to raise some money to do it. Because when I say we, it was still just me. Okay, that's not true actually. <laughs> I skipped a really good part. 
I needed help on customer service with Recycled Bride at a certain point, and I only knew one guy that was out of work and had the expertise that I really, really trusted, and he was my ex-husband. So I hired him, and he is still part of the company today, and he is awesome, and we are great friends. And so that had a happy ending. Um, but anyway, as I started to think about launching Tradesy, I looked around, and there was a lot of competition. But it's a re competition's a really interesting thing. If you're doing something or thinking about doing something and nobody else in the world is doing it, then there's a 1% chance that you are a freaking genius, and there's a 99% chance that your idea sucks. Because if there's like a big market opportunity and something that customers really want, you're probably not the only person who's gonna think of it. And so, Competition is like this fallacy, right? You'll hear a lot of like, oh, I mean, ob the obvious question I got all the time, why would you do this? There's eBay, right? And now we have 10 other competitors and they all have more money than we do. How are you gonna do this? Other people are funded, you know, that's what I would always hear. I don't know, all I know is that I've seen giants fall. I've seen well-funded companies fall apart. I've seen people with perfectly great feet not be able to dance. I've seen a lot of weird stuff. Um, and I think that a crowded market with healthy competition means that you're probably barking up the wrong tree and now you need to stop looking at them and just focus on your goal. Um, so that applies everywhere across the board. Like, is that person better than me, smarter than me, gonna do better than me? Is that company better than me, smarter than me? The only thing you have as an entrepreneur, the only, well, I mean, some of you might have more than this, but all I had was time. And every minute spent looking at the competition was a minute I didn't spend getting where I was going. So it's not to say I never did that, because I definitely looked at some competitors' sites and went, oh no, they figured that thing out. But the more you can avoid that, the better. It's a, competition is a lie. Like don't ever let anyone tell you, oh, your idea is no good because someone else is doing it. That means that there's room for it and you can beat them. Um, so it was time for me to fundraise, to grow a team, and make this whole tradesy thing happen. Um, and what helped me a lot was the fact that I had already done so much of the work, right? So by the time I emerged from my little work cave into the world and I decided to apply to Launchpad, the incubator in LA, they were like, where, where did you come from? How are you operating like a profitable startup here alone and no one's ever met you? And I was like, well, because I've been building a profitable startup for years, like not going out, not meeting people. Um, and getting in was not easy, but I was able to because of this. It, this is like a little tiny peak. This is what I think got me into Launchpad. So. I went in and I met with the powers that be at Launchpad, namely Sam Teller, who's the managing director. And we had a really nice meeting. And he was like, where's your team? <laughs> How come you're outsourcing technology? Why don't you have a co-founder? Why don't you have this or that? And I left the meeting and I thought, ah, I knew he liked me, but I didn't think he was gonna let me in because I didn't meet the requirements of having a team and having a technical co-founder. So I went home and I stayed up all night, it's a theme, and I made a deck for him, a, five, a little five page deck, like with slides like no technical lead, no problem. And we go together like, you know, Recycled Media and Launchpad LA equals synergy. Um, and I got a call from him like the very next day, like a few hours after I sent it, and he said, all right, I want you to talk to some of the other directors here and it's looking good for you. Um, so I'm really glad I did that. <laughs> um, but you know, once you like lay low, beef up on your arsenal so you've got something impressive to show and then get out there and show it. But this was also a big turning point because what I had built at that time, and I didn't know any of the terminology, now I know it. I had a lifestyle business. A lifestyle business means you make some money and you put it in your pocket and you live. Um, the alternative to a lifestyle business, at least in technology and in startups, is a venture-backed business, which is a whole other animal. So in a lifestyle business, you wanna make more money than you spend. In a venture-backed business, you wanna spend a ton of money and grow really, really fast and not worry about revenue until you've reached scale. 
That sounded upside down and backwards to me when I first heard this concept at Launchpad. And I didn't know this concept until I got into Launchpad. And they kind of said, what are you doing here if you don't intend to be a venture-backed company? And I said, well, no, I'm just going to self-fund. I've gotten pretty good at it, and I'll just grow it, and it'll, it'll be cool. And they were like, no, no, if you want to make an impact, you have to grow fast. You have to build quick. I thought I could get away with taking 50000 here, 50000 there. And then Mark Schuster, like locked me in a room one day. He didn't lock me in the room, but he put me in a room one day and he was like, you're driving a bus. Your gas tank is running low. Your job is to put gas in the tank and get people on the bus or you're going to go off the cliff and you're going to stall and you're going to die and you're not going to (laughs) matter. And he was right. Um, because I was trying to walk a line of that was like in between a lifestyle business and an venture back. I was like, I'm going to have a really big company, but I'm going to bootstrap it. This was the turning point where I said, you know what? I'm going to go big or go, and this was go big or go work from home because I could, I, Recycled Bride started making a lot more money. Like if, I, if it was a lifestyle business, I'd be totally relaxed right now. But I decided to throw it all on the table and aim really high and take a lot of money in and build that team. Um, and it's just a different model. So I won't go so deep into it because I feel like I've been talking to you guys for like seven hours. <laughs> so, um, but, Ping me if you want to talk about whether your business should be a lifestyle business or a venture-backed business. Um, And so in Launchpad, this is the same kind of concept. Like when you have a lifestyle business and you have a a small business and you're starting up, you're a founder. Once you take money, uh, you're a CEO. Um, You have employees, you have investors, you have a board. Um, You have a lot of paperwork. (laughs) And um, that was what happened to me. Um, right after Launchpad when we raised our $1.5 million round. So then let's, if we have 10 to 15 minutes, let's talk about fundraising. It's the worst thing you'll ever do in your entire life. And so kind of going back to walk the walk before you talk the talk, I strongly suggest you don't have to like rent out your place on Airbnb and do all the crazy stuff that I did. But I strongly suggest you spend some time bootstrapping before you even think about taking investment capital. Um, There are a couple of reasons for that. One is, so I started off totally inexperienced and now I know some stuff. I wouldn't know most of that stuff if I hadn't been severely resource constrained because it's one thing now to be able to say, hey, you know what, we need to send out an email series and they have to have graphics and we have to put tracking codes in them. Uh, can someone do this? I didn't, there was no one to do anything and I had to learn everything. And the only reason I can have 14 employees now is because I've done all their jobs, mostly poorly, but I've done them and I know the mechanics of them. So it makes me better at hiring. It makes me better at everything because I've had a little taste of every single department and that was how I learned. Um, so I strongly suggest the training wheels of being a founder for like a good long time before you even think about taking in capital and becoming a CEO. And then when you go out and fundraise, (sighs) it's really hard. So it goes back to that whole rejection thing that it'll happen and it'll kill you and you gotta keep bouncing back. I didn't do such a good job of that by the way. So in six weeks of fundraising, I pitched about 70 investors. We have six investors, so that means 64 people didn't believe in me or my business enough to want to back it. There were days that I did 10 meetings back to back and heard all no's and all for different reasons, and it was super, it was demoralizing. It is the story of every entrepreneur. It is how everyone, even successful, established entrepreneurs, it's how it works with fundraising. But it's rough, and you better know your stuff. Um, for me, I, I had another Mark Schuster gem. While I was fundraising, he came into Launchpad, and he said, you look defeated. 
And I was like, I am defeated. And he's like, no one wants to invest in a loser. You look super defeated. You got to stop that. It's terrible. And I was like, I feel so much more defeated now. Thank you for that. Um, but it was hard. It's like, it's like dating. Like, you don't want to show up to a date feeling lonely. People can just feel that. And you don't want to show up to <laughs> fundraising feeling desperate or defeated. And, and, and it's hard not to. Um, but it's all part of, like, building up that armor that you need to keep going. Um, so I could tell you guys a lot of like tales from the front lines of fundraising, but I won't because they're ugly. Um, so then we raised a bunch of money, got a bunch of employees, launched a website, and holy crap, we got so much press. So the day we launched, we got coverage in like every major tech and business publication that we knew existed. And that was cool. But what was even cooler was that um, like a week later, um, the PR, our PR firm called and they said, so Good Morning America wants to shoot a segment here in LA tomorrow. And we were like, oh my God, tomorrow? Okay, we had to get all these girls who would let us come into their closets. It was really hard to pull it together. And I didn't really sleep the night before because I was getting it all together, but we did it. And well, when we started shooting that segment, it was on Thursday morning, the PR firm called back and they said, and they want to do a live one in New York tomorrow morning with the tape segment. And I was like, well, how does anybody get to New York by then? And she said, I don't know, but somebody has to. Well, guess who somebody is? <laughs> so it was the middle of, um, it was right after Hurricane Sandy. And there were no cars, um, th there was no gas, so there were no taxis from the airports in New York. So I, basically, I shot a taped segment in LA from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. to 2 p.m., got on a 4 p.m. flight to New York, landed at 12.30. My husband's godson, who had a friend who owned a gas station on Long Island, came and picked me up at the airport, drove me into Manhattan, went to a friend's house, showered, got dressed, Good Morning America, car picked me up at 5.30 in the morning. At 6.30, I was standing in the middle of Times Square in a booth that said, cash for your closet, appraising the outfits of tourists for the camera. At 8.30, I was hanging out with Laura Spencer, doing a segment, sounding like an expert. Um, and at 8.40, <laughs> um, I was upstairs at Good Morning America doing customer service. <laughs> and because we didn't have enough customer service to handle this giant bump and I hadn't slept in a few days and then I got on a plane home and I did customer service the whole way home um, and got back to the office where a bunch of exhausted, exhausted employees greeted me and we stayed and we packed shipping kits until two or three in the morning and woke up and did it all again the next day. Yeah, you want to do this? <laughs> um, and it's a... so. I was kind of talking about like the highs and the lows, and this is a perfect example of that. National, tel like I had never done national television live. And then also the coolest thing was that I was standing in the middle of Times Square and they showed the tape segment, which I hadn't seen yet. And the first part of it was this graphic that like spun in and it was a smartphone and it had eBay, Amazon, Tradesy. And I could hear vaguely the tape segment, and it was like, eBay and Amazon have a new neighbor. Look out, it's crazy. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> but in the next couple of days, the site went down. We had angry customers posting on Facebook. Our shipping system completely fell apart because we weren't prepared, and we had overlooked a bunch of stuff. Uh, and I thought I had screwed the whole thing up. <laughs> like, the whole thing, you know, not just this, the whole thing. Um, and that's pretty typical. That's like kind of how it is. So once you start to get a little bit of traction and success, there's this weird phenomenon. It's that thing where like, if you think you're, like, it, it's a perception thing. People start to think that you have answers. That's why I'm just telling you guys, so I don't have any answers, you know? And nobody does. 